what modern physics says actually this this kind of discreteness of matter the sort of atomic nature of matter is actually not really fundamentally there the the fields themselves are continuous and it's just that if you want to put some energy into the field there is a minimum amount of energy you can put in to make a ripple you can't make one that's smaller than that and that's the part of it. but in some sense it, it kind of echoes i suppose there are echoes of the ether but one of the sort of remarkable things about quantum field theory is it says that we are all part of the same fundamental object and so like every electron in our bodies is a vibration in the same field so we are made of physically the same thing which is all connected through the whole universe so in that sense we're all connected to each other directly So, we hear you are an atomic chef. You have a cookbook for building things out of atoms, or even building atoms themselves. Well, I, I suppose you could put it that way. Yeah, I mean, the book is really about where does matter come from? So, where does the, the physical stuff that makes up the world around us come from? Mm. And it's, um, the title is How to Make an Apple Pie from Scratch which is actually a riff on a, uh, and if you've heard of an American astrophysicist called Carl Sagan, but he was sort of one of the, he was a, he was a very famous science popularizer of the 1980s. And in his famous uh, TV documentary series, Cosmos, there's this, there's this strange scene at the beginning of an episode where an apple pie is made to a rather sort of portentous sounding musical score that sounds like it's a bit like out of 2001 A Space Odyssey. And then this apple pie is brought out to Sagan and put down in front of him. And he looks at the camera and says, if you wish to make an apple pie from scratch, you must first invent the universe. And it, it's <laughs> sort of, yeah. the idea is that even a kind of really mundane object like an apple pie, if you really want to understand where it comes from and the, the basic ingredients that apple pie come from, you, you can't just go to the shops. You're going to have to sort of invent the entire universe in order to create the things that make up that apple pie. So that's kind of the, the hook for the story. But really, the book is about... Where does the physical stuff around us come from? How do we figure it out? And what do we still not understand about the origins of matter? And so how did you come to be interested in the question of why there is something rather than nothing? Um, well, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure I'd necessarily put it that way. I, I think what I've always been interested in, I think remember the, sort of having this experience at school is the thing that's I find very appealing about physics and particle physics in particular is that if you look at the world around us, it's really complicated. There's all kinds of, you know, things going on, including human beings and living, other living things. There's, you know, stars and planets and there's this immense sort of variety and richness. And what physics says is that all of that complexity ultimately can be explained in terms of a very small number of simple ingredients uh, obeying relatively simple laws so if you if you and that's the sort of the triumph i guess of physics over the last 200 years i remember having this experience at, in school at chemistry where you know your chemistry you learn about the different elements in the periodic table so you know you learn that say if you take sodium and put it in water it fizzes and, and zooms around on the surface and gives off little bubbles and and then you say if you have i don't know a piece of gold for example you put that in water nothing happens in fact it, it doesn't you know gold is very very unchanging and unreactive and in, in chemistry, we learn, at, we learn at school that, well, you can understand these different ways that these materials behave in terms of their atomic structure. So you kind of get taught that each one of these elements has an atom, and these atoms have particles going around them called electrons. And the way those electrons arrange themselves around the atom and the number of electrons determines how those materials behave. And so you, you go from sort of, you know, however many it is, 90, more than 90 elements in a periodic table. And you can understand those in terms of atoms and electrons. And that's a huge like, simplification. And, and particle physics can, uh, continues that story of saying, well, OK, if we keep breaking atoms down, what do we find? How do we understand the more fundamental ingredients, how they behave? And I think that's the sort of that's what I find appealing about the subject. It's, it is an amazing fact that we basically think that the universe is only made. Well, OK, OK put a qualifier the visible universe the stuff that we're made of stars and planets everything we see when we look in the sky is only made of three different types of particle and they behave 
they, they uh, move around and interact with each other through very simple laws. And you can explain everything. In principle, all this complexity emerges from those three ingredients. And that's an amazing thing, I think. And those ingredients are electrons, protons and neutrons? Well, that's what we thought around 1930. But actually, we now know that protons and neutrons, which are particles you find inside the nucleus of the atom. So the atom has this central nucleus and the electrons go around it. Inside the nucleus, there are protons and neutrons. But if you zoom in on the protons and neutrons, you find that actually they're made of even smaller things that are called quarks. So the, the, two, the two particles that make them up are called up quarks and down quarks. So we're made of electrons, up quarks and down quarks. And that's, that's it. What exactly is a particle? Mm. <laughs> That's a very good question. And it's not, you kind of, I guess the sort of way you might imagine a particle and the, the word suggests this is you could think of it, say, as a little sphere or a little ball moving around. You know, and often when we draw diagrams of atoms, say, you might draw like a little central dot for the nucleus and you draw the electrons as little sort of dots moving around. But that isn't really, well, it's actually not how we think of particles at all. And actually asking that question, you know, what is a particle, um, has led to some really profound discoveries in, in physics. The, the way we currently understand what a particle is, is, well, it's kind of strange in a sense. So particle physics, the subject, is in a way badly named because we don't think of particles as being fundamental, really. They're made of something else. Mm. Uh, and that something else are these rather strange, um, ethereal, otherworldly objects called quantum fields, um, and which sounds kind of, it's kind of possibly slightly scary sounding term, but to kind of break it down a bit, we've all experienced, a, I would imagine, a, the effect of a field. So if you've ever held, say, two magnets, uh, put the, say, take, taken the two North Poles and pushed them together, as they get closer, you start to feel this repulsive force and you actually can kind of, if you wiggle the magnets around, you can sort of feel this kind of almost, almost like there's a sort of lump, some, some repulsive lump in between the two poles of the magnet. And that's an undeniably physical thing. But if you look really, really close, you won't see anything. There's nothing there. You can put your hand through the gap. Nothing's blocking it. What you're feeling there is a field. And, the, and in this case, it's a magnetic field. So but your hand does diminish that, uh, that effect quite a bit. Yeah, if you put your hand in the way, it will block the magnetic field, but you don't, your hand doesn't feel anything. So, I mean, you know, there's nothing so, physical, you know, that blocks you when you move through. So, so things are, so, so matter is made out of effects? It's made up of fields. But so, aren't, aren't fields effects? Well, I mean, everything's an effect, I suppose. But, um, but yeah, I mean, so, you know, you, you have this magnetic field. There are actually a whole bunch of fields that we know about. In fact, for every particle that we know about, there is a corresponding field. So if you take the electron, which is the particle around the outside of the atom, there is something associated with that called the electron field. And electrons we think of as being, these particles are actually thought of as little vibrations, little ripples in this field. So it's a bit like ripples moving on the surface of a pond or something. Well, so it's interesting so, that you say ripples. So this is this is something that's kind of a big change in how people conceived of matter, right? Because previously it was seen to be made out of objects, right? Mm. And so there's this transition to quantum fields. And you say that, you know, it's like fields on the on the surface or ripples on the surface of a pond. But the pond is an object and the waves are ripples in that medium. So it's not quite a perfect metaphor because it seems like quantum fields aren't described as being waves in a medium. Well, the quantum fields, in some sense, you could think of as the medium itself. And the, and the medium is fundamental. And that's one of the sort of interesting things, actually. Like, we, if you go back to some, someone like... Uh, there's this figure from ancient Greece that physicists like to mention whenever they write books in order to sound brainy. This guy called Democritus, <laughs> who's supposed to be the person who first came up with the idea of atoms. And, and what Democritus said was that matter is made of atoms, which are these indestructible little nuggets, these lumps, and everything is just atoms and the void. Mm -hmm. And by the void, he means empty space. And so you can think of the universe as just these balls, basically, bouncing mm. around in empty space. And what you know, 
that view is wrong, actually. <laughs> that, you know, the Greeks were wrong? Does any, did Greeks anyone tell them? Who does thunk it? Oh, no. I, mean, I, I think Democritus is one of the most overrated figures. <laughs> <laughs> all, he, all he did was, you know, oh, maybe there are atoms. He did nothing to check this idea. You know, it, it's, uh, he I put it in a really beautiful poem, actually, to be fair. <laughs> okay. You know, I think it's the, uh, it's <laughs> the only physics paper that's uh, written in poem form that I'm aware of. <laughs> That is, that's that's fair. A good presentation, maybe. Okay, <laughs> but, um, but still, no evidence. I mean, yeah. So, but what 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 modern physics says actually this this kind of discreteness of matter, the sort of atomic nature of matter, is actually not really fundamentally there. Hmm. The the fields themselves are continuous, and it's just that there is a minimum amount of vibration that a field can sustain. So, if you you think of the, I mean. It isn't any analogy is imperfect, but if you want to think of the field as some kind of medium, like like water, like water or, or like air, then you know in in ordinary you know basically what this says is that if you want to put some energy into the field, there is a minimum amount of energy you can put in to make a ripple. You can't make one that's smaller than that, and that's mm. the part. So, but, yeah. so so is this then related in any way to the ether theories that were around prior to Einstein? I mean, it, it, it kind of is... Spiritually, I mean? <laughs> not really. I mean, the ether mm. theory was to say... Well, I suppose in some sense, it, it kind of echoes, I suppose. There are echoes of the ether. But mm. ether theory was that there was some medium which was just like air or water. It was a physical substance. Um, and the problem with the ether theory, basically, is that it doesn't agree with relativity which so if it so what relativity einstein's theory of relativity says is that the speed of light the speed with which light travels is the same no matter how fast you're moving how fast the light source is moving whatever everyone agrees on the speed of light which actually you can't explain with a medium like ether because if you think about i don't know let's say we think about um a water wave a wave in water for example if you, actually, a better example maybe is sound. Actually, okay. So let, let's take sound. So the, the speed of um, the speed of sound in air is three hundred and thirty meters a second. So let's say I'm like yelling at you, you know, or there's an alarm going off or some music playing, and you're standing still. You'll see. You'll measure the 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 sound waves arriving at you at three hundred and thirty meters a second. But let's say then you start to walk towards me at I don't know two meters a second or something you will then measure the speed of light i suppose the speed of sound as being 332 meters per second because you're moving towards the source and the waves coming at you so you add the speeds together now light doesn't behave that way which is weird so if you mm. if you the equivalent of shining a torch and then uh, at, at, say at you and then you start to come towards me even though the light is leaving my torch at the speed of light and i measure that and you're moving towards me you still measure the light arriving at you at the speed of light so it doesn't add up in the same way so, isn't that what a redshift is though well that's a frequency shift so ah, yeah, they're, they're two different effects you get yeah you get a shift in frequency so if i if you come towards me the light will be shifted to the high frequency and so go it will go blue actually if you're moving towards if you run away from me it'll get red and if you come towards me it'll get blue same thing with like ambulance sirens when you go you hear an ambulance going past it's high pitched as it comes towards you and then low pitched as it goes away but that's sort of different from the speed. It, that's an effect of the just the way that the, the speed at which the, the wave crests arrive at you, but mm. um, of time between them. But yeah, so what this the only way you can make sense of this? How how can you measure the same speed as me when we're both moving at different speeds? Well, on our planet, we just assume that the signal is traveling in the atoms themselves. So if the atoms are moving, then the deformation of the atoms, which is the light, would travel at the same speed. So everything works out. Not sure it would. I think according to what, you, what you've just said would mean that there would be a fixed medium. If you're saying it's a disturbance of the atoms, then you wouldn't, if you move net relative to the atoms, then the speed of light wouldn't be the same for everyone. It would depend on how you move. Well, the speed depends on the deformation of the material, the atoms. So even if the atom's moving, it still deforms at the same speed. Ah, I see what you're saying. Well, that's actually okay. In that sense, maybe we're talking about the same thing. So, different, different talking? planet, different planet, Doctor Cliff. So, same laws of physics, <laughs> different universe. Uh, yeah. Same laws of physics, different way of looking at it. Yeah, but the the only way to get around this is to say, 
Well, we might if if we just if we agree on if we think the speeds are the same, but we're moving at different speeds. The only way to reconcile this is if we disagree on what space and time are. So speed is distance over time. So if we if we measure different distances and different times, then we can have the same speed of light even though we're moving, and that's what relativity says. So there isn't a, if if there was an ether like medium, it wouldn't behave this way. We would get different speeds of light. So these quantum fields are, are strange in the sense that. They are not like an ether. They are kind of that. They are what we call relativistically invariant. So they, they, they sort of. If you, they don't sort of behave like a physical medium. They're sort of subtler and stranger in that sense. But there is a. So there's a very long-winded answer to your question. But that they're kind of echoes of each other, but not the same idea. Hmm. I think yeah. that's a good answer. I mean, my my question from that then goes to some of the studies that I've read about on Earth, where people publish that they've manage to freeze light or they've managed to slow down light is this just a misreporting of what's actually happening or how does that fit into the idea that light speed is always the same well i mean the speed of light is always the same in vacuum so if there's nothing there but if there's a medium that it's traveling through the speed of light changes so if you you know when light goes into say water or, or glass or even air the speed of light is actually a little bit slower than um, when it's just traveling through empty space. And that's why, you know, when, if you say stick a, uh, say a, a pole or a stick into a swimming pool, it looks like it bends. And that's because mm. of the, the different speeds that light's traveling in the water and in the air. So it's definitely possible to slow light down. Mm. Um, Is it possible to actually have a full vacuum? Like even out in space, aren't there atoms that the light is traveling between? Like, can you have light without atoms? You can have light without atoms, yeah. Where does it come from? A, well, light, again, is light is a ripple in a quantum field. So light is a ripple in the electromagnetic field, which is another one of these quantum fields. So if you take a bit of space and remove all the atoms, all the particles and everything, then in that empty space, there is still the quantum fields, so even if there are no particles moving around in them. So you can never really, in a sense, that's what we call the vacuum, but the vacuum itself is, any, is actually not empty. It contains these quantum fields. And actually... One of the weird things about modern particle physics is the vacuum turns out to be a really complicated place because these quantum fields are always kind of jittering and, and sort of vi and pulsating a little bit gently, even when you've got no particles. But put that, putting that aside, in such an environment, the speed of light would be exactly the speed of light. But as soon as you start to introduce matter, it would be a bit slower, depending on how much there is and what its density is and so on. So the idea that there's this substance that is a field that permeates everything, it is often linked to kind of, I don't know how to put this kindly, woo ideas. Have you noticed this? <laughs> yeah, that does happen. I think the idea of sort of invisible objects that surround us and connect us <laughs> sometimes kind of take that a bit too far. I mean, yeah. So, I mean, there, there is this, you know, this isn't what isn't woo, as you put it, is that one of the sort of remarkable things about quantum field theory is it says that we are all part of the same fundamental object. So we are all connected. I knew it. We're all, we're all connected. So like every electron in our bodies is a vibration in the same field. So we are, you know, made of physically the same thing, which is all connected through the whole universe. So in that sense, we're all connected to each other directly. Cosmic um, cobwebs. Yeah. But I mean, that doesn't mean you can sort of transmit like good feelings through the, <laughs> through the vacuum or, <laughs> you know, kind of psychic fields or whatever. But I, I think that's why people start to talk about those sorts of ideas because it, yeah, it kind of sounds a bit like some of that stuff. Seems like throwing the word quantum in front of your product just automatically increases its marketing value by uh, like 300%. Quantum water yeah. purification. Yeah. So do you think that this is something that has deeper meaning than just physics? What do you mean? Suppose, well, it depends what you mean by deeper meaning. I mean, in a sense, physics is the deep... Well, it depends what you mean by meaning again. Like, mm. like, I'm getting is, philosophically here. So, so, scientifically, physics is, the, in a sense, the deepest subject. Like, you, you can't go any deeper than, than... Well, by definition, if we found something deeper, that would also be physics, because you would just say, that's physics now. <laughs> um, <laughs> we keep that now, too. Yeah, but in, in terms of meaning, I mean, I think meaning is something that human beings 
invent and, and ascribe to things. I mean, I think, so Steven Weinberg, who's a very, was a sort of leading physicist of the 20th century who died uh, very recently, just earlier this year. He, so he was one of the founders of the standard model, this quantum field theory describes the universe around us. And he, one of the, in his book, one of the things he wrote was, the more the universe seems comprehensible, the more it seems pointless. Hmm. Uh, so, wow. you know, That's very dark. I mean, it's dark, it, but I think, I mean, I think we're not, if you're looking for meaning, you're not going to find it in the laws of physics. You, you might find, you'll find, what you will find is mm. how the universe works. But in terms of how you should live your life or what the purpose of it all, I think it's very unlikely that physics is going to give you those answers. But meaning is something we have to all decide upon ourselves, I think. I think that's a really astute observation. But it brings up this other question of why, if half of, you know, life isn't physical, isn't physics, let's say, we can talk about what physics actually means in a second, but if half of biology is physics, it's strange that the biologists on Earth seem to kick everything down to the physics. Like, all of the explanations always terminate in physics. They, well, that, I'm not sure that a biologist would necessarily agree with that. I mean, there's, there's, this, there's this funny thing, which is we have a pretty good understanding of the fundamental laws and the fundamental ingredients of the universe. Now, there are things we don't understand for sure, but in terms of atoms and so on, we've got a pretty good solid understanding that works very, very well in every, in almost every experiment we've ever done. But that doesn't mean that just because you know the fundamental laws that you understand, say, anything as complicated as a living thing based on physics. So, you know, if you take fundamental physics, there's, a, there's this famous thing, actually, we, we go to astronomy called the three body problem, which is if you have a system, well, so you start with two bodies like the sun and the earth, that system you can accurately describe using equations. You can, if you have two bodies and that's it, you can predict arbitrarily far in the future how the earth will move around the sun. As soon as you introduce a third body like the moon, you can't calculate it anymore. And you have to do computer simulations and at four and five, it gets worse and worse and worse and worse. So this is true in fundamental physics too, down at the atomic level. If you want to, you know, even to describe something as complicated as an at as simple as an atom mm. or as, or a molecule becomes really insuperably difficult using quantum field theory. And very quickly you find that you can't calculate any further and you have to start from a, a sort of a higher level. You say, okay, well, I'm not going to worry about what the fundamental particles are doing. I'm going to treat, say, the atoms themselves as fundamental and try to understand mm. my model that way. So you this know, idea yeah. of fundamentality is very context dependent on like what kind of problem you're trying to solve, it seems like. Yeah, and, and you know, you can't necessarily understand the behavior of a system based on its fundamental laws. Things emerge. So even if you have simple ingredients by obeying simple laws, there are phenomena, when you have lots of those things interacting with each other, phenomena emerge that don't, exist at the fundamental level which you can't describe mm. like you know if you take an extreme example if you were trying to understand say economics using physics no chance you're never gonna, <laughs> that's why i mean i'm not sure you can understand economics using e economics frankly I mean, <laughs> a little like, dig there yeah i like that but, but i mean you know you've got a better shot using economics than you have with physics physics is no use whatsoever so and same with biology i mean there are areas of biology where you know quantum mechanics is being applied but broadly speaking you know you you while I would believe, I believe, I suppose that living things ultimately are generated by fundamental ingredients obeying simple laws. Going from those simple laws to a biological organism is impossible. And you, you, you know, or more, not, may not impossible perhaps, but incredibly difficult. So difficult, we'll, you know, we're, we're very, very, very long way from being able to do that. So is there, do you ever question the value of seeking the fundamental? Um, well, it depends. No, no I'm not, not because I think it depends what you're interested in. Mm. You know, the only, there's, I mean, there's different reasons for, for, for doing fundamental physics. And, uh, you know, there's lots of practical reasons why you might want to do it. And we've discovered lots of important phenomena and technologies as a result of fundamental physics research. But I think most physicists, at least most particle physicists and cosmologists, they're not, they're not doing it because of, wanting to necessarily solve a practical problem they're just interested in the same way you know an artist is is interested in playing with artistic ideas or, or kind of you know it, and I, that's it, really the difference between science and technology it seems like science is sort of about understanding how things happen and technology is like let's make something out of this 
Yeah, I mean, the lines aren't always so clear, right? But I mean, but certainly, you know, the reason I'm in physics is because I just find these ideas fascinating and I, I want to understand them and I want to know more. And that's why, and I, I think this, the sort of, I talk about this in the book, that the story, if you look at the story of how we assembled this picture of the world, it's an, it's an amazing example of what human beings can do, you know, kind of working together over, over long periods of time, but, you know, huge numbers of people contributing. And the fact that you can go so far and understand so much is is remarkable and i think that that's what appeals to me but you know um and i I love that part of your book too i wanted to just add for our listeners that this is a fantastic desk reference for the whole history of atomic physics it's really a really wonderful read just to sort of see all the sort of heartbreak and struggle that people went through to determine the theories that they have today And the question, I guess, when I ask about the value of pursuing the fundamental, at some point does become economic, right? Because these are expensive machines that are required to be able to ask these questions. And it seems like physics on Earth gets a pretty big chunk of the available funding. Would you agree or disagree? Uh, It depends how you look at it. I mean, in terms of pure scientific funding on the physical sciences side yes but in terms of absolute spending no i mean you know far more money is spent on say biomedicine than on fundamental physics i think i, I forget the numbers but it's, biomedicine is a pretty profitable technology so that makes is, sense yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah in terms of good returns on that yeah but it, it, it's not it's not cheap but i mean to put it in context uh, the cost of the large hadron collider um, I'll, I think one of my colleagues, a guy called Andrew Steele, worked this out and f- showed that the cost of the LHC and the sort of research that we do at CERN is about something of the order of a couple of dollars per person per year. So it's about the co- I think the way he put it was it's the cost of a packet of peanuts each to sort of, you know, find out about the Higgs boson and stuff. So it sort of depends whether you think that level of spending is is you know too much or you don't want to be spending two dollars a year or you, you it's not enough or you know whatever but well that actually I, speaks to scale right because yeah. if you look at the gross number of dollars spent and it seems enormous but you come down and you see that it, per person it's really not that much that would mean that a huge number of scientists are focused on these questions of fundamental physics right yeah and that's why we can only build these projects like the LHC with international collaboration. So, you know, you know, the United States is involved in CERN, but so, you know, they've so got most of the countries in Europe and all actually increasingly in Asia and in other, in other continents as well. So it's really, you know, you can only build these huge machines through international collaboration. And I think actually in a way that is one of the strongest arguments for why, well, beside the scientific ones, which of course are, I guess, the most important arguments, but, you know, one of the very strong arguments is that CERN and the LHC program is one of the best examples of international collaboration for peaceful purposes. And I think that's one of the... Team building for Project Human. Yeah, exactly. And I think, you know, I think actually other areas have a lot to learn from particle physics. It shows what, you know, when you, you know, when you, Physics is a sort of universal subject and, you know, people, if, if you bring people together, it doesn't matter where they're from, what their backgrounds are, they're interested in finding these answers, then actually that is enough to unify them. And, you know, CERN is, a, I think, a fantastic, yeah, a sort of, um, yeah, example of what people can do working together. And I think you could, you could learn lessons in other areas. But I mean, so there's that. But I mean, also in terms of that's not enough to get the funding, I think a lot of the arguments are also around spin-off technologies. So when you build these big machines, you're solving very, very difficult technical problems. And you quite often solving those problems produces incidental technological discoveries that then have applications. So a really good example of this I came across a few years ago was the, the, LA, the these accelerators require very powerful superconducting magnets. And I went to a company in the South of England who manufacture the coils for these superconducting magnets. And they took a lot of con- a lot of contracts from CERN and from particle physics experiments. And what the, the guy said to me, the, who I met there, was that actually they often make a loss or usually make a loss on their contracts with CERN. Hmm. But the reason they take them is because in the pro- usually CERN says, I want you to build something that has never been built before. And they'll learn new techniques, develop new, new ways of building things, new technologies. And CERN pays most of that cost but then they can use that R&D that they've developed in practical applications. So they were just in the process of marketing a anti-cancer therapy machine, which mm. basically is a small particle accelerator that accelerates protons 
and shoots them into tumors, which is much more effective than re traditional radiotherapy. And they had only learned how to work with these coils because of their work in particle physics. So that's just one example. I mean, the World Wide Web is another that was invented at CERN to help physicists exchange uh, information. So, I mean, that was given away for nothing. So you kind of get these technological spin-offs that come out of the projects, although they're not the reason that ultimately that they're built. Hmm. And so is there a point where it will be impossible to continue building larger and larger accelerators? Is CERN the, the sort of the end of the road in terms of complexity and expense? Or can you imagine something that's even larger with a larger cohort of countries and funders? Yeah, I mean, well, they're, they're already... I should maybe distinguish CERN from the LHC. So mm. CERN is the European, Org European Organization for Nuclear Research, which is a big international lab. Um, and it's the host of the Large Hadron Collider, which is this 27 kilometer circumference particle accelerator. Um, but there are already proposals for the next machine. And the next machine uh, is a current, well, there's various proposals. There's one in China, there's one in Europe. But in essence, what they are, 100 kilometer circumference machines. Mm. The reason they're bigger, it's basically the, the LHC in some sense, you can think of it as like a microscope. And there's this interesting relationship in quantum physics between the energy of, a, of say, when you, if you say collide two particles, um, as you collide them with higher and higher energy, you start to see shorter and shorter distances. So you see smaller and smaller and smaller details. So you're basically zooming in um, as you do this. And so the more energy you can put into your collisions, the smaller you can see and the sort of the more things you can discover. And so that's why the, re the reason these machines have to be very big is to accelerate these particles to a very, very high speed as you have to. Um, the only way this is done is you send the particles around a ring and at one point on the ring, they're given a little kick in energy. So they get a bit faster and they go around again, get a bit faster and a bit faster and a bit faster. And the, the rest of the tube is really just a way to bring the particles back around again so they can be accelerated. And then eventually, when they're going quickly enough, they collide. Um, but the, the problem is that these particles are going fantastically quickly, almost the speed of light. And the, the way to, in order to make them go on a ring, you have to apply an incredibly powerful force to bend them. So you think about driving your car around a corner. If you're going really fast, you need a lot of traction in the tires so you don't slide off the road. It's the same sort of thing. Um, and the reason the LHC, uh, well, is, is big is because we can only build magnets that are so strong. And if we wanted to make it smaller, that would be a tighter bend. We'd have to have more powerful magnets. And when it was designed, we didn't have magnets powerful enough. So the only one, there's, there's two things you can do. Either you can build more powerful magnets or you can make the machine bigger. Because if you make it bigger, the curve is gentler. You don't need such a strong force. So the next machine will both have more powerful magnets and be bigger. So you'll be able to push the energy up by a factor of 10, roughly. Um, and that will allow you to give you a really good chance of discovering new stuff. So, yeah, these projects are always being, already being thought of. They're a long time scale. So, you know, th this, if, if this machine was built, it would probably not start operation for about 15 years, maybe mm. more. Um, and it would run until the 20s, 60s or 70s. So you're talking about, you know, almost half a century of physics. out. So, yeah, and the only way it's going to be built is with international collaboration and the job really is to make the case as well as there's to make the political case to make the public case but also there's a lot of r d going on to see you know obviously there's development on the magnets and the civil engineering and all kinds of things that has to happen to make this a reality so it's definitely not a, a done deal that this is going to happen we'll have to see um but that's where physics where particle physics is, uh, is sort of pushing things at the moment and we'll, we'll have to see what happens and is the goal to find the end of physics yeah, I was going to say, like, the the <laughs> bigger machines you build, the more particles you seem to discover. Do you think there's really an end in sight? Is there actually a fundamental particle? So, yeah, because and how would the fundamental particle be discovered? You'd crash two things into each other and there just wouldn't be anything smaller? Yeah, I mean, well, it, it's sort of... When, when I say we sort of zoom in and we discover new things, we're not necessarily discovering things that are um, sort of the building blocks of the things we found before. That, that mm. has happened. So... In the 1960s, where there was a big accelerator near San Francisco that fired electrons at protons and it discovered quarks. So it found these quarks inside the protons. So we, protons were previously thought of being fundamental and it was realized that protons aren't fundamental. They're made of quarks. But actually, the electrons and the quarks and so on, we've known about for, you know, in the case of quarks, more than half a century now. 
we still think they're fundamental. What we've actually found are other particles. So we've found particles that are associated with the forces of nature, um, which were discussed, some, some of which were discovered in the 1980s. The most recent one was the Higgs boson, which is a particle that's uh, associated with why the other particles have mass. So why, why the things that make up our, the atoms in our bodies have mass. So we're discovering these new ingredients, but we're not necessarily finding things that those particles are made of, that it's mm. sort of new parts of the puzzle. And this is actually one of the reasons, right? interestingly, one of the big questions that this new machine would be trying to answer is, is the Higgs boson really a fundamental particle? Because the Higgs boson is a really weird thing. It basically, without getting into too much technical detail, it's very hard to understand how such a particle can exist. Um, and it oughtn't, according to what we understand about quantum mechanics and fields, this thing shouldn't exist. In the Why is that? Can you go into a little bit of detail to sort of outline the, the challenge and the question here? Yeah. So this is the basic issue. The Higgs, the Higgs boson tells us there's something called a Higgs field. So just like the other particles, there's a field that goes with this particle. And the particle is actually a ripple in the field. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And this field, the Higgs field, is a unique field in the sense that every other field that we know about, if you take out all the particles then it has a value that it's basically zero. So it goes down to zero. There's a little bit of quantum vibrations going on. But apart from that, it's zero. The Higgs field has a constant value everywhere. So it's non-zero, a bit like uh, the universe having a constant temperature or something. And it's this non-zero value that is responsible for the mass, the, the mass of the fundamental particles. So if you imagine, if you think about this, this value as like a, a thermostat or something, if you turned it down to zero, electrons and quarks would have no mass and the atom, atoms wouldn't form. There'd be nothing, there'd be no structure in the universe. If you make it stronger, if you turn up the dial of the Higgs field, after a while, eventually the particles become so heavy that everything would collapse into a black hole and again, you wouldn't have structure. And the, the really weird thing about the Higgs field is that when you calculate how it ought to behave according to our current theories basically the only two options should be zero or it turned on all the way so either universe with no atoms or everything's a black hole <laughs> and the value that we observe is this weird finely tuned value that it's very specific it's almost like a kind of goldilocks value that is in just the right place to allow atoms to exist and therefore us to exist now this is really, really fishy and weird, and we would like to understand why this is. And, and sort of this problem can be solved if the Higgs boson isn't fundamental. If, if it's made of smaller things, then you can understand much more easily why it has to have this particular value. But, and, and that's one of the big jobs of this next machine. So it basically will make lots and lots of Higgs bosons, zoom in on them effectively, really, really precisely, and try to see if there are things inside the Higgs boson? Because if there are, we might get an answer to this question um, of basically, this question is actually, that sounds a bit, maybe a bit prosaic, but the question really is, why is there stuff in the universe? Why, why do we exist? Because if <laughs> things were different, we wouldn't be here. Why is there and, something uh, rather uh, than nothing? We come back, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And Dr. Cliff, uh, we probably should have got to this earlier, but you did some work at one of these colliders at some point or? What oh, was I still your, do, yeah. Oh, you still do, sorry. Yeah, so my day job is as a particle physicist on one of the LHC experiments. So there are, you've got this big ring, particles go around, they collide, and then there are four places on that ring where we've built these enormous detectors. So these they're giant things. They're kind of the size of office buildings or cathedrals, which are basically, you can think of them as enormous three-dimensional digital cameras, and the collisions happen inside these detectors. And their job is to, particles collide, you get big firework of particles going everywhere. And the detector's job is to record those collisions and try to see if we can see mm. new particles, for example. Um, so I work on one of the experiments called LHCB, uh, which is we're, we're basically studying a particular type of particle called a bottom quark, which is an exotic quark, a kind of cousin of the quarks that you find inside atoms. And these things are really interesting because these bottom quarks, the way they behave can give us clues to the existence of, say, new fundamental forces or new particles that we've not seen before. So our, the, the game we play is basically make lots and lots of these bottom quarks. We study them in really precise detail and try to see places where they disagree with our theoretical predictions, because that can be a kind of indirect hint 
that there might be, for example, a new force of nature out there. And that's, that's what I, so my job basically is analyzing the data from the experiment and trying to find places where our current theories are breaking down. Hmm. Mm. And sorry, hold on, I have a question. And this might be stupid, but what are the detectors actually detecting? Well, they're detecting particles, so... But they detect particles, but, I mean, is this electro... Is this electricity? Is this... Like, it's just an electric signal? Well, yeah, it all ends up as an electric signal, ultimately, but the base, these detectors are sort of like um, onions, in a sense. They have many layers, and the different layers have different jobs. So if you imagine these collisions happening, the two protons collide, and then you get hundreds of particles produced that go flying out from the, the center. And in the middle of the detector... You have usually have something called a tracking system, which is often made of silicon. So, uh, for example, in LHCb, we have this detector with little pix silicon pixels. Um, and what happens is when a particle like an electron or a charged particle goes through one of those pixels, it gives off a little electrical ping, hmm. and, which we read out. And so what if you imagine... Like a CCD or something? Like a CMOS chip uh, or something? Not, not, not a million miles away from that kind of thing. And... What you end up with is the little electrical signals left in a line. So as the particle moves through the detector, you get dick, 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 and then you can reconstruct the trajectory, the track the particle's taken. Um, you go a bit further out, there are these very heavy detectors called calorimeters, which are usually made of iron or some very dense metal. And their job, when particles hit them, they basically get slowed down really quickly, and their energy is turned into light. So you get a big splurt, big flash of light produced. And then again, you have detectors that add up the light and that light tells you how much energy the particle has. So you basically have these different, there's other kinds of things, I won't go into all the details, but basically you have all these different types of detector. When they bring them together, they can tell you, you know, where did the particle go? Um, how fast was it going? How much energy did it have? What type of particle was it? There's ways of figuring that out as well. So, so you're, ultimately that all gets turned into electrical signals coming out of the detector, which you then have to reconstruct afterwards but yeah it kind of the particles interact with the detector in different ways depending on the material and what you're trying to do interesting so not, a stupid, not a stupid question at all <laughs> well because i just i've always wondered because you know you talk about detecting things and this reminds me a little bit of was it was it rutherford who did the gold foil experiment mm. is that is it related sort of in conception to that like how do you how do you build something like this how do you go yeah, about well, inventing this? Well, it's in Rutherford's case, the detector was a PhD student. So <laughs> <laughs> Poor kid. Oh, the disposable, yeah. right? Yeah. I mean, in those days, it was really, you know, it made, I mean, you, it was kind of really grueling work. So basically what they were doing, um, so this famous gold foil experiment is the experiment where they discovered the atomic nucleus. And basically what they were doing was using radioactive elements to fire particles out of so basically these, these elements is radium i think radium which produces particles that come come out that's the radiation you have a gold straight at the gold. grad student's face <laughs> More or less, yeah into a piece of gold foil and then you have a the, basically what is a what's called a scintillator which is a tire uh, in this case i think it was sort of basically a photographic plate with some um a chemical spread on it and when a, a particle hits the screen it gives off a little flicker of light, like a tiny flicker. So what would what the, the PhD student's job was, was to sit in a very dark laboratory with a microscope looking at this screen. So imagine the sort of particles are coming in, they hit the screen, and he's, he's sitting there for hours and hours and hours counting flickers, these tiny little flickers of light. So in that case, you know, the detector is the human, well, it's sort of, it's, well, ultimately it's the human eye. So the light from the flickers hits the eye, in some ways, that's a bit like a detector, you know, the, the eye has sort of cells in it, they're sensitive to light, that sends electrical signals to the brain, and the student then writes down, you know, how many particles have they seen. And so conceptually, not that different as compared to the particle, you know, the detectors at CERN, instead of having a human eye, we have, say, a piece of silicon, which takes the, which counts the particles sort of for us automatically through computers and so on. So we've kind of removed the, to a large extent, the human element from this, because, you know, the, the, the the rate in those days you're kind of he was counting you know maybe a flicker every few seconds or something now we are doing collisions 40 million times every second and each collision might produce a thousand particles so yeah and also the rate the radiation levels the energies involved you can't have graduate students all sitting around <laughs> you'd need new graduate students every semester yeah, you'd need new ones pretty quickly. So, um, so yeah, I think in, in, conceptually it's not that different, really. But 
um, it, the technology is obviously completely different now and on a much bigger scale. And on a, I think on a scale that Rutherford could never have imagined in 1908 when he was, when he was doing these experiments. Mm. So then that kind of leads me to the next vision, which is, are there different technologies on the table for doing fundamental physics research? Or is smashing things into one another basically the end of the road here? I mean, smashing things is always going to be one of the best. <laughs> 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 so that, so that's the, uh, hopefully smashing things has got a long way to go still. I mean, there, there, there is this problem, of course, of scale, as you, as you say. So there probably is a limit on how big you can build these things just in terms of what society is willing to pay for, right? I mean, in principle, you could keep building them bigger and bigger. You know, you could build them as big as the moon if you wanted to, but, you know, we're never going to... I can't see how we'd ever afford something like that. So there is a limit in that sense. So there's two answers. One is technological innovation. So how could you find a way of accelerating particles over much shorter distances? And there are technologies coming down the line that might allow us to do that. So there are things called um, plasma wake field accelerators. And I, don't ask me how they work because I don't really know. <laughs> but um, <laughs> they, they basically promise, they have the potential to accelerate particles to energies that, like LHC type energies over distances of meters instead of kilometers. Whoa. So they, they could really change the game, but they're still in a kind of, they're still in an early R and D phase and they're a long way away from being applied in a, a, a physics experiment. Mm. But that could happen in the future. But there are also lots of other ways of doing these sorts of things. I mean, I was recently at a, a workshop actually about the use of quantum technology so you, you said how you, you know put the word quantum as things everyone gets it's a scam watch out <laughs> yeah. but this is a, w one of the projects that um uh my boss actually at cambridge and a, a bunch of other people around the uk are involved in is to build a new type of uh gravitational wave detector based on this is going to get a bit technical based on basically um causing uh atoms to go into a quantum state and allowing them to kind of travel in two different directions. So there's this weird thing in quantum mechanics where a particle can be in two places at once. So in between the observations, this part of the particles travel is something called the wave function, which is sort of this very strange mathematical object that describes the probability of finding the particle at a given location. It, it makes a lot more sense once we start thinking about particles as ripples. As behaviors, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, that's finding true. a ripple in two different places doesn't seem that far out. Yeah, but these detectors basically work by putting an atom into a quantum state and then allowing it to travel in two along two different paths. So the same atom is going in two different places, and then you bring the waves back together. They recombine, and if say a gravitational wave comes along, it can alter the way that this wave travels along one arm or another, and that can give you signs of you know. They can, they can tell you about, the, say, a, a, so a gravitational wave I haven't explained at all, but these are these are ripples in space time, so ripples in the fabric of reality, basically, that are produced by very energetic processes out in the universe, like black holes banging into each other, for example. So these are kind of quite promising new technologies that might allow us, for example, one of the, one of the reasons we want to sort of create these very high energies in colliders is because we're, in some sense, recreating the conditions that existed in the very earliest moments of the Big Bang. So, you know, millionths of a second after the Big Bang or trillionths of a second after the Big Bang in some cases. And if you want to keep going closer and closer to the Big Bang, the energies get bigger and bigger and you need a bigger, bigger accelerator. So another possibility is you might be able to detect signals from that time still. So in these very, very early moments of the universe with huge amounts of energy, there would have been gravitational waves created, so these waves in space-time. And in principle, these waves could still be around us now. They're just very faint and hard to detect. Well, these detectors might be able to pick up waves from these very early moments after the Big Bang. So, Do you think that by understanding gravity at these really small scales that humans will ever be able to manipulate gravity itself? Mm. Oh, God, I have no idea, honestly. I, mean, <laughs> I, I guess the, the answer to that would be, I suppose, if we're ever going to be able to manipulate gravity, we better understand it. So that's so if, if there is a way to do it, then that's probably the way to do it. But I, I honestly have no idea. <laughs> that's Not tomorrow. Funny. Well, can you imagine being able to manipulate the Higgs field? 
I think, again, it's, it's very hard to conceive of at the moment, partly because of how difficult it is to, say, create Higgs bosons, you know, but, you know, who knows in the far distant future. I mean, actually, there was a, an article written by a colleague of mine, a professor called John Butterworth, who's the head of physics, or was the head of physics at uh, University College London. And he writes, he basically, he was talking about, you know, why do you fund physics? And he was saying, you know, well, okay, we talk about the spin-offs, you know, cancer therapy machines, uh, new types of information technology and so on. But actually, what about applying the fundamental knowledge? Mm. Um, yeah, he sort of had this throwaway. I think the title of the article was something along the lines of, um, why can't we have an interstellar Higgs drive? You know, in other words, you know, maybe in a in hundred years or a thousand years, we'll be able to apply this fundamental knowledge in some piece of technology. It's kind of really hard to foresee. That's the that's what makes fundamental physics blue and blue skies research in general difficult because even so, let, let's we take an example like the discovery of the electron, which was the, discovered in eighteen ninety seven. Um, by a man called Joseph John Thompson in a little university laboratory, and quite recently, uh, really, by all measures, by, in terms of the age of the universe, yeah, pretty recent. <laughs> um, he he said at the time, you know, I I can't see any practical application for these electrons. They're, they're you know, it's a sci- it's a kind of scientific curiosity. Wow. And he and then within not not just now, but within I think the you know, space of a decade, the under- understanding of electrons became really fundamental to technology. And now you know our whole you know, s- s- silicon chips, basically all of our modern technology relies on understanding the way the electrons behave. But at the time of the discovery, it was very hard to foresee any of that. So I think the same thing is true now that the Higgs boson may have an application or it may not, we don't know, but you know, we, we won't, if, if it does have an application, we may not find out for quite some time. Mm. That's um, really I, I have kind of a question that might be out of left field and pardon me for this, but the, the model is electricity created by the electron Mm. magnetic fields created by the magnetron or is there not is there something that creates the magnetic field do we know ah okay so well electricity is just a flow of electrons Mm. um but there isn't an equivalent for magnetism so there is Is that weird well electricity well electricity and magnetism well okay are basically well, there's, there's two different things. The electron has an electric charge, and that means that it affects the electromagnetic field. So you have the electron, then there's this other thing called the electromagnetic field. So if you move an electron about, because it has a charge, it will create disturbances in the electromagnetic field. And basically, you know, actually, we electromagnet, so electricity, electricity and magnetism are actually two aspects of the same field which was discovered in the 19th century so actually you can by having a changing for example if you have a change in magnetic field you can generate an electric current the reverse is also true if you have an electric current you can generate a changing magnetic field you can change it so so these two, two things are intertwined with each other and but in like a like a rare earth magnet there's no current flowing but there is magnetism yeah so that's because um atoms themselves have little bar magnets associated. It actually, use, fundamentally, actually, it comes from the electrons and the the particles that make up the nucleus. So the, the electron itself behaves like a little bar magnet. So it has an electric charge, but it also has a north and a south pole. Um, and that's sort of because, in some sense, the electron is spinning. So it has mm. a, it's almost like a rotation. And because it's got a charge and it's rotating, that creates a magnetic field. Mm. So um, there, there, is a, there is a sort of separate question, which is, okay, we have electric charge for electricity. Is there an equivalent? Is there a magnetic charge for magnetism? And so far, we've only ever found magnets that have a north and a south pole. So it's like you always have positive and negative magnetism together. You can never have them separated. There is this idea of something called a magnetic monopole, which would be just a north pole or just a south pole on its own, which would be a bit like an electric charge, but for magnetism. And people have looked for these things. There are actually experiments at CERN looking for them, but no one's ever found one. Hmm. Okay, so there is something that would be at CERN, but it's not necessarily been observed yet. Yeah, and potentially at CERN, potentially in other places. I think there are other experiments as well that look for these things, but um, you know, there's no one's yet seen one. A lot of this seems computational, right? Where you have physicists that are smashing things together. There's reconstructions of mathematical relationships. Do you ever worry that physics will get taken over by artificial intelligence as it becomes more advanced? 
don't know if I worry about it. It's um, in fact, I look forward to it. It, it. I mean, it already has happened to an extent, mm. right? So, you know, I use artificial intelligence, albeit not very advanced artificial intelligence, in my day job all the time. So, you know, we use machine learning. Depends what you mean by artificial intelligence, but you know, we use machine learning to. We have a huge numbers of collisions, millions every second, as I said. You know, and then you have a whole year of these things. So, you've got huge amounts of data, and usually, the thing you're looking for is very, very rare. So, what we often do is train machine learning algorithms like neural networks or other things that will learn to distinguish background from signal and it will sift the data and find the little thing that you're interested in. And that's all based on having some expectation of what the thing looks like that you're looking for. So in some sense, it's already there. I mean, there is another idea, there is, a, there is another possible, you know, there are many other possible applications. I mean, there is there are ideas that maybe AIs ultimately might be used to sort of make progress in theoretical physics, which is something that we haven't yet managed to do but one of the sort of i suppose interesting things that's happened in the last 20 30 years is if you went back to the late 80s or early 90s a lot of physicists thought that we were on the brink of discovering what weinberg called a final theory so a sort of ultimate theory of everything describing all of physics and this the, the promising candidate back then was string theory and what was discovered over the last three three decades is that string theory is very, very hard. And it's, <laughs> it's very hard for human beings with our limited brains to make progress. And the calculations are very difficult. There is progress being made all the time, but we've, we're a long way still from, I think, string theory or any other purported theory of everything from, you know, being able to really be sort of tested or, or understood properly. And I think even string theorists would say they don't really know what string theory is still. Um, so may, maybe that's a... Maybe that's, it could be the reason that progress has been slow is that these ideas are maybe just too hard for human beings, or we can only make very gradual progress. We're at the limits of our intellectual capacity because there's no reason to think that human beings should necessarily be able to grasp any idea. I mean, you can't teach your dog quantum field theory, you know, so there's no reason why we should necessarily be able to understand any scientific idea either. So maybe, you know, and there are actually people working on this there's um, to basically build an AI that might be able to make progress faster than a human being could. Because in principle, with an AI, it doesn't have to be educated or sent to university. You can just feed it everything we know about physics, presumably quite quickly, and then <laughs> set it running. I guess it would sort of turn physics into a bit of a spectator sport for human beings, where we just wait for the art the machine to answer the question. <laughs> <laughs> a bit like in, um, if you read The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, where they... There's this machine called Deep Thought, which is this huge supercomputer that's asked to solve the mystery of life, the universe, and everything. But when it eventually finishes the calculations after millions of years, it just gives this answer 42, um, which is a sort of joke by Douglas Adams. But I mean, in a the sense, there's some, you know, it could be that even if this AI could figure out the answer to these questions, maybe it couldn't explain them to us. Maybe, maybe and that seems to kind of be, to bring it back to what we were talking about earlier, this kind of goes at the heart of, well, maybe physics isn't necessarily the central theme of the universe Maybe, at least not of life oh of life yeah sorry what we have to define the universe carefully um there's, there's certainly more to life than physics yeah I, I, even i would agree with that. <laughs> <laughs> but you know it's like i it's really interesting because i think most physicists would agree with that however the general public you know has been losing interest in religion steadily for the last i think 100 years or so on earth at least the last 50. And I think they're more and more turning to science and physics and hoping that it can actually answer some of these deeper questions. Of, of meaning, you mean? Yeah, of just well, like the yeah. position of humans in the world? Yeah. I think, yeah, I, I, I find that, I don't know if I find that troubling a little bit. I think there's, I mean, I think there's something that I certainly experience as a scientist, and not just as a scientist, but someone who's interested in science and consumes popular science and ideas from other areas of science is you do, I think from science, what you do get is a sense of awe and wonder and kind of the, you get moved, I think, you often find yourself moved by the kind of, without sounding a bit corny, like the majesty of the universe. Totally. I mean, I, I, I've had experience, I remember this experience, which I talked about in the book, actually, when I was in Australia on a very dark night quite far away from any major cities and seeing the night sky and the Milky Way in sort of this incredible detail that I'd mm. never seen in London where, you know, there's so much light pollution, you can't see very much. And I did have this sort of sense of almost 
being overwhelmed by it. It was sort of so powerful. And mm. I think that, so there, there's science can, can I think give you that emotional experience but in terms of actual meaning. I mean, if, if we try to derive meaning from science, I'm not sure that's a, 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 a fruitful direction. Because I think ultimately what physics seems to say is that, yes, the universe is wonderful and interesting, but the laws of physics are kind of cold and hard and they don't care about human beings. We're just a, an emergent property of these laws. So the universe doesn't care about us, basically. So Sure, but even in terms of cause and effect, like if you were trying to explain why these atoms in my hand here moved over here, you probably wouldn't be able to discover it from just atomic physics. You'd have to actually think about the life form and my intention of moving them. Yeah. And so there's actual real physical effects, obviously, of something that isn't physics. Intention. Well, I mean, I suppose it depends what you believe, but I mean, I would still probably argue that intention or whatever, you, you know, the decisions you make ultimately are rooted in fundamental particles obeying laws. But that doesn't mean we can understand thoughts and intention using those laws but i still think that's probably what's going on but you do make decisions right I but mean, it has I to be a mediator at some point right so if you drill down and there's there has to be some connection between intention and action and that has to be a physical mediator right but maybe it's not the cause hmm. maybe the the decision is the cause spooky anyways what do you make of that dr cliff well I mean, what, I suppose what I would say, you know, we, we can build AIs that make decisions already. So, you know, the, these things I talked about earlier where they look for rare particles, it makes a decision. Is this thing the thing we're interested in or is it not? And it doesn't. It makes a decision because we've programmed quite often an architecture that's based a bit on how a brain works. It has sort of these virtual neurons that connect to each other that, you know, there's a kind of, it's a logical system where input goes in, it gets processed internally, and then a decision is made. And that's, I'm not being a neuroscientist, but, you know, my, under, my very limited understanding of neuroscience, that's sort of how the brain works. It's it, it much more complicated and much bigger and much more, many, many more neurons, but it takes in stimuli information and it, because of its internal structure, which is a property of evolution, but also our experiences, mm. our education, it makes a decision. And we, so we, we make decisions, but that's sort of different from free will, which is maybe we, we probably don't have a choice in the decisions we make in the sense that our brains are machines that are programmed to make decisions, but we couldn't make a different decision. It's sort of a, so in that sense, I would say it's all still physics. So you're a big um, believer in fate. It sounds like. Not fate, but I guess I don't, well, destiny. Physics is not deterministic. And we know that because of quantum mechanics. So, you know, if you took it, because, because quantum mechanics says that you can never know the outcome of, say, a particle interaction. You can only know the probability of different outcomes. And if you do enough of the, enough experiments, you'll see that they line up with those probabilities. I guess the brain is the same. So if you took the same brain, gave it the same stimuli, because of, and asked it to make a decision, it wouldn't always make the same decision because of randomness and because of quantum mechanics. But that doesn't mean we have an actual ability to choose. We're still at the mercy of quantum mechanics quantum mechanics is sort of deciding for us in some sense but don't you have so, to make choices all day long like what kind of food you want to eat for dinner and what sort of yeah. experiments you're going to do well, this is a philosophical question as to what is actually making the decision for you is Hell it yeah, the quantum it state of the neurons or is it something else that's like a consciousness that's outside of the physical body right yeah, I, I would argue that I, I, would, I think without any evidence. <laughs> well, not with, based on the fact we haven't discovered anything that isn't physical, that consciousness is just a product of particles and atoms and physical objects, and it's an emergent property. But it doesn't mean that I don't believe that there's a sort of consciousness field or, or something else hmm. like that. So I, when you make a decision about what you have for lunch, that's based on, you know, the structure of your brain, which was formed by your entire life and, you know, what you've figured out you enjoy. And so you might choose to have a cheese sandwich or have mm. a tuna sandwich, depending on how you're feeling. But ultimately, you could probably figure out why you made that decision based on, you know, the feelings you're getting from your stomach, <laughs> what you had yesterday, you know. But emergent properties can be causative, right? Because like fields are emergent properties too, as far as I can tell, if they're excitations of something. Well, particles are emergent. No, particles, sorry, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. 
yeah, it's I a mean, chicken or egg question, I guess, at the end of the day. It's always just sort of interesting to kick it around. and yeah. Because, you know, I, I, one of the smartest critiques I ever heard was like the idea that there's tactical and strategic free will. And, and the idea that, well, yeah, like you're a human, so you're probably going to be not, you know, flying off and going up and catching some other birds in the sky to eat. You know, you are limited in what you can do. So your free will is sort of, you know, strategically limited, but you can choose what you want to eat once you're on the ground. So there's, there's sort of, it's sort of by degrees, you know, there, this isn't a black and white situation perhaps. Mm. Yeah. I mean, you, you definitely choose, but I don't think you have a choice in what you choose. If that makes sense. Um, you know. Are you afraid though, that that's sort of like, let serial killers and uh, terrorists and child molesters off the hook a little bit? No, because their brains are machines that made bad decisions. So if you believe that you're just your brain, then that brain needs to be, you know, I, well, I don't know, maybe punishment's not right, but it needs to be removed. From Unplugged? <laughs> Re-educated, prevented from doing that again in some way. So if, if you believe that you are just your brain and the atoms in your brain, if your brain is making poor decisions and doing evil things or things that are harmful to other people, that doesn't mean you're not responsible because all you are is that machine, mm. is you. Is, is that, saying you're not responsible sort of implies the existence of some incorporeal soul or something and that, you know, the soul is being blamed for this, logic machine that's just making decisions but you know if you just believe all you are is the machine then you know you're responsible whatever that means it's interesting that this is kind of the questions that people want to get answers to from physics mm. like i feel like fundamentally this is why there's a huge interest in quantum physics and people want to be able to turn to the scientists that are doing this kind of research and get answers for the biggest questions that they've ever had of why am I like this? Why is the world like this? Why, why do I make bad decisions? Yeah. Or good decisions, you know? And yeah. it's interesting because you come to the physicists. Well, people usually take credit for the good ones. Yeah, that's true. But you come to the physicists and they're like, ah, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, we're, we're the wrong people to ask. Ask the neuroscientists. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And the neuroscientists are like, I, I don't know, ask the biologists. There's electricity. Ask the, ask the psychologists. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> cool, man. Well, it was really fun to talk to you. Mm -hmm. I hope we can meet up again uh, down the road when you maybe get another book ready or... Weeks. Yeah, that would be well. There is an, a second one in the works, so hopefully in, <laughs> in a few years when I finally finish that one. What awesome. are you working on? Oh, it's, so the book is about, uh, there's one of the interesting, one of the really intriguing things that's happening in fundamental physics at the moment is we, in lots of areas in cosmology and particle physics, there are these weird anomalies that have been cropping up. So places where the data from our observations or experiments doesn't match up with theory. And it, they're kind of, these anomalies are really uncertain. We don't really know if they're real or not yet, but if they are real, they could be pointing to some big change in how we understand the world. Mm. So the book is going to be about those anomalies, the people involved in discovering them and working on them. And I'm one of those people, actually. So I work on some of these anomalies at my experiment. And um, yeah, what, what it could mean and whether, well, yeah, also, could it be a, a mistake? Could it be a cock up in our experiments? <laughs> Do you have a working title for that yet? Yeah, it's called Space Oddities. Ooh, oh. that's good. That's very good. Awesome. I'm really looking forward to that. Yeah, that'll be great. Thank you. I hope, fingers crossed <laughs> once I get started. So where can people find you, Dr. Cliff, if they're looking for more of you? Um, well, I'm on Twitter, so you can follow me at Harry V. Cliff. Uh, I've also got a website, um, www.harrycliff.co.uk, where you can sort of find out what I've been up to. And the book, uh, How to Make Apple Pie from Scratch, you can get in all good bookshops and also on Amazon and other places like that. Excellent. And you have some stand-up comedy available, I've also seen? Oh, God, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's like 10 years. You'll see a much younger version of me um, like 10 years ago. Uh, I'm not sure I'd necessarily recommend that. <laughs> <laughs> it was very good. It was very good. I liked it. Maybe there'll be a resurgence in the next 10 years. Exactly. Maybe. 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 <laughs> okay. cool. All right, well, thank you so much for joining us. Have a great rest of your day. Likewise. Really great talking to you. See ya. Bye. Bye.